it, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22, please. Matthew chapter 22, and beginning in verse 34 as we continue what it means to live on mission in the church, in the community, in the kingdom of Christ. Someone has said the love of God is greater far than tongue or quill can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God sent his son to win. His every child he reconciled and pardoned from their sin. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. And it is to that love of God, and in return love for God, that we look to this morning. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The last Sunday we examined this perspective from Luke, but Luke leaves out what Matthew is intending to write here. Remember, the Gospels are not primarily historical accounts, although they are historically accurate, but rather they are written to particular audiences. And Matthew very much has a Jewish audience in mind, and so he adds something that Luke, writing to Gentiles, does not. In verse 40, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up this Thursday. Guys, in case you've forgotten about it, I've had some interesting experiences on Valentine's Day. More successful when I've gone out to see widows and given them candy and cards on those particular days. You can really make their day. You just got to make sure you include everybody and don't leave someone out, which is harder to do than it looks. But I've had other days where I've had a particular uh, date or dates that have not gone according to plan. I remember one time in seminary, and I can tell this story because the, the girl I'm referring to, I won't mention her name, and she hadn't listened to my sermons in 10 years, so I think we're fine here. It had gotten to the end of seminary class that had it all day long. It went from, you know, 7 in the morning until 9 that night. And I said, you know, why don't we plan on doing Valentine's Day, either the day before or the day after, and take you out, we can have a good time. But if we go out on Valentine's with the class schedule, I bet half the restaurants are going to be closed. We're both going to be tired. And uh, she said, no, I, wonder, I really want to go ahead and spend the day with you tonight. And so I said, okay. So we go out. I think it was to Rafferty's or somewhere off of uh, Blankenbaker. No, it was, I went off Blankenbaker. It was off Breckenridge Lane outside Louisville. And it was closed, of course. It was 930 by the time we got there. And we looked around and we thought about, you know, what are we going to do? We could go somewhere else another time. And I looked in the direction and just joked, and I said, you know, there's a Denny's over there. My pastor and I used to go there all the time, and I was just joking at her. And, she, and here's what she said. She said, well, that's okay. Let's just go ahead and go to Denny's. Now, guys, here's the mistake I made. I take everything logically. If somebody says something out loud, I assume that's what you meant. So I just decided to go over to Denny's, and I decided right before I got in the door that what I had decided and what she had decided were two totally different things. Let's just put it this way. That did not work out very well. So if you are, if you are looking for future romance ideas, first, don't come to me. Second, always here in between the lines. You know, Human love sometimes works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. There's a lot of things from which we get love. We get it from human beings, get it from pets, get it from hobbies, from other things, and so forth and so on. But the Bible tells us that eventually all of those things are going to cease. But love of God and love for God are the great pursuits of life. That love of God trumps every other kind of love, and that love for God is more rewarding than any other kind of love, for God himself is love. Even the Apostle Paul will write in his seminal chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he says that knowledge will cease, tongues will vanish away, but love remains. 
now abides these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. What you and I tend to do in our human limitations is we equate that to human love, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about the never-ending, unfailing, far-reaching, unceasing love of God. And here the attorney comes and questions Jesus in the same context and in the same way we're just given an extra phrase that Jesus says here, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We know that from Luke. Here he says, what is the great commandment in the law? He responds to that. And then he says, on all of this depend all of the law and all of the prophets. In other words, the law of God is entirely, completely dependent upon the law of love. And if you need a reference for it, it's Jesus himself who says it right here. It is the foundation of everything we do. You can have brick and mortar, you can have walls and roofs, but if you don't have the foundation of love, it's all in vain. And so what many in the church and many within the culture will seek to do is to say the law of God is a constraining thing. It is a confining thing. It is simply to keep you in your place. When the Bible actually says the law of God is governed by the law of love. And the law of God is only practiced because, ultimately, of God's great love. Where we get to is everybody likes the great commandment in theory. Love God with everything you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. But almost no one actually likes it in practice. Who among us loves the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind every moment of every day? We don't. That's why total depravity simply means that we need God's help in every area of life. We can't do this apart from him. David will talk about this in the Psalms. He talks about not giving anything that costs nothing, not holding back. And the question for us is, in our attempts to be Martha, do we still have room for Mary? Not just do you serve him, but do you love him? David will say, I love the Lord because he has inclined himself unto me. Why should we love God. There shouldn't be any doubt that God loves us. God so loved the world. But why should we have love for God? The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. But I think there's specific reasons why we can count and claim our love for God. Because he keeps his word. You know, you can go to the bank and most of the time they'll keep their word to you. But if the economy drags and the FDIC runs out and credit is dissolved, you're not guaranteed to get whatever you put in to the bank back out. But if the bank were to go empty and everything else run dry, the love of God would still have full credit. The promises of God would still ring true. This whole world can come to an end. This whole church can be destroyed and the love of God hasn't gone anywhere because God keeps his word. I think sometimes we operate, you know, from a from a standpoint of fear rather than a standpoint of faith, it's our natural inclination when things get stressful, anxiety sets in. A lot of times in goal setting, people will ask the question, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? So reach for the stars, go for whatever your dreams are. I think there's a much better question than that for believers to do. What would you do if you knew the promises of God could not fail? What would you do if the word of God was totally true and God could not lie because he doesn't and he won't. Sometimes when we move into big conversations or we talk about doing good things, a lot of times we'll discern the will of God based on how we feel. Well, I don't have a good feeling about this. And we understand that feelings are important. They're not something that we should easily dismiss. But feelings are not ultimately what is defining of our faith. You think Abraham had a good feeling when he was getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac? You think Moses had a good feeling standing before Pharaoh? Jonah felt real good going into Nineveh and preaching to his enemies the truth of the gospel. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, as excited as he could be, so excited that he prayed, God, if it be your will, let it go. 
It's not about whether or not you have a good feeling. It's about whether or not God has called you to step out in faith. It's about whether or not his promises are true. It's what Jesus will will call out to constantly. God says, this is how you can demonstrate love for God. When you keep my commandments, when you stand on the word and you believe that it's true, Jesus will say to Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, who had failed, will go out and be the pillar and the rock that the church needs, standing on the rock of Christ. Paul will say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That love of God means love for God, and love for God is the great pursuit of life when I give him everything that I have because I know the return will be more than I could ever have. But love for God naturally leads to love for others because Jesus says the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor on yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. One writer puts it this way, first the Ten Commandments, then Jesus make it very clear that there are two kinds of important relationships for human beings. One is a relationship between human beings and God, and the other is a relationship between human beings. The way we treat each other is a reflection of what we think of him. And so the Lord says you have to love your neighbor. Because on this depends all of the law, all of the prophets. And so the question you have to ask each and every day for those by whom you're surrounded, family, friends, colleagues, enemies, whoever, is you have to ask each and every day, what is the most loving thing I can do for this person? What is the most loving thing I can say to this person? What is the most loving way I can live for this person? He says, your reflection of how you treat others is a direct connection to how you believe God has treated you. So your ability to be kind and patient with others is directly related to your view of God's patience and kindness to you. Your view of being loving towards others is directly related to how you see God's love towards you. And you say, how do I love my neighbor? Here's how. Hear it out. By not making it about you. By always, always, always making it about the Lord and making it about others. Part of what it means to to be on mission is to put the mission ahead of yourselves who are willing to give up our rights for the sake of others, who follow in the example of Jesus, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not about you. It is not about me. It is about Jesus. And therefore, we love our neighbor as ourselves. Do any of us really love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves? Maybe we're willing to give up stuff for our kids, but for for our spouse, but for our neighbors? Do any of us really do for others as much as we do for ourselves? And then, do you do for others what you wish they would do for you? It's not enough simply to not do unto others what you don't want done to you. You have to do for others what you wish someone would do on your behalf. And so when someone accidentally cuts you off, do you give them a break? You ever thought about what it's like to be on the other end of the phone line? You're chewing somebody out. See, the natural inclination is to retaliate when others wrong us, but this passage doesn't ask us whether or not you would do the same as me. It asks us whether or not you would do the same for me. So they define it as the golden rule. And the question is, do you do to the Lord what you would have him do for you? Lord, I want you to bless me. Are you blessing him? Lord, I want your presence to be in my life. How often do you come to his house? Lord, I want your will. Are you being obedient to his commands? Here's the thing. 
It's incredibly difficult to show love for others when we don't display love for God because all of these other qualifications are simply building blocks or stepping stones. The golden rule is the peak of everything that Jesus talks about here. It is the very essence of the law and prophets, he tells us. It is a demonstration of God's spirit of holiness working in your life. So much of the fightings in our world today, so many of the quarrels are because men and women knowingly and willingly trample justice under under their feet while demanding perfect justice for themselves because we don't seek the good of others we simply seek our own good and so Jesus will say seek his kingdom and seek his righteousness which means seeking after the lost seeking after the neighbors because all the golden rule will ultimately do is drive you to hopelessness if you try to do it on your own or it will drive you to Christ because only the one who has kept the golden rule can forgive you for breaking it. What you need is Jesus. What I need is Jesus. It's not simply enough to not want bad for others. Well, I don't want harm to come to them. Well, great, step one. Step two in this commandment is to actively seek their good. Jesus expects his disciples to want, someone said, for themselves and for others, exactly what he wants for us. I was moved this past week. I don't know if you saw some of the news articles that came out. Maybe you saw some things on social media. Uh, Pastor Ted Chrisman of Heritage Baptist Church in Owensboro passed away this past week. Maybe several of you knew him unexpectedly. Had a massive heart attack this past Monday at a pastor's gathering that he held once a month. He'd been pastor of Heritage Baptist Church since 1973 there in Owensboro. I was now the pastor of counseling, I think. Um, but if you will look over some of the things that have taken place in his life, the number of people who posted on his wall about he personally impacted them just through a call or a letter or a hug or whatever, a lot of the stuff that he was doing for them was pastoral, but a lot of it was stuff that anyone can do. It was just being there. It was just showing up. And at the end of the day, people aren't going to remember how good your sermons were or how good of a Sunday school lesson you taught or how good of a teacher you were in the classroom, but they will remember how well you loved they will remember whether or not you cared. Arthur Burns, who's a Jewish economist, has a lot of, had a lot of influence in Washington during the tenure of several presidents, was asked to pray at a, at a gathering a while back of uh, evangelical politicians. I put evangelical in quotes because I don't think that word really has any meaning anymore, but that's just me. Here's his prayer. He said, Lord, I pray that Jews would come to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that Buddhists would come to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that Muslims would come to know Jesus Christ. And then he closed the prayer with, and Lord, I pray that Christians would come to know Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, if we'll ever live that out, if we'll let everything that's said, even the truth that we speak, be done in love, that's what it means to be on mission for God when we realize God's overwhelming love for us. That is the hope of the world in Christ. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.